Yesterday, in discussions with the leaders of Israel and Egypt, I secured an agreement for the first shipment of humanitarian assistance from the United Nations to Palestinian civilians in Gaza. If Hamas does not divert or steal this shipment, these shipments, we're going to provide an opening for sustained delivery of life-saving humanitarian assistance for the Palestinians. As I said in Israel, as hard as it is, we cannot give up on peace. We cannot give up on a two-state solution. Israel and Palestinians equally deserve to live in safety, dignity, and peace. You know, and here at home, we have to be honest with ourselves. In recent years, too much hate has given too much oxygen, fueling racism, the rise of anti-Semitism, Islamic phobia, right here in America. It's also intensified in the wake of recent events that led to the horrific threats and attacks that both shock us and break our hearts. On October 7th, terror attacks have triggered deep scars and terrible memories in the Jewish community. Today, Jewish families worried about being targeted in school, wearing symbols of their face walking down the street, or going out about their daily lives. And I know many of you in the Muslim American community, the Arab American community, the Palestinian American community, and so many others are outraged and hearty saying to yourselves, here we go again with Islamophobia and distrust we saw after 9-11. Just last week, a mother was brutally stabbed. A little boy here in the United States, a little boy who just turned six years old was murdered in their home outside of Chicago. His name was Wadiha, Wadiha, a proud American, a proud Palestinian-American family. We can't stand by and stand silent when this happens. We must, without equivocation, denounce anti-Semitism. We must also, without equivocation, denounce Islamophobia. And to all you hurting, those of you hurting, I want you to know I see you. You belong. And I want to say this to you. You're all America. You're all America. This is in a moment, there's, you know, in moments like these, <clears throat> when fear and suspicion anger and rage run hard, that we have to work harder than ever to hold on to the values that make us who we are. We're a nation of religious freedom, freedom of expression. We all have a right to debate and disagree without fear of being targeted in schools or workplaces or in our communities. <clears throat> we must renounce violence and vitriol, see each other not as enemies but as fellow Americans. When I was in Israel yesterday, I uh, said that when America experienced the hell of 9-11, we felt enraged as well. While we sought and got justice, we made mistakes. So I cautioned the government of Israel not to be blinded by rage. And here in America, let us not forget who we are. We reject all forms, all forms of hate, whether against Muslim, Jews, or anyone. That's what great nations do. And we are a great nation. On Ukraine, I'm asking Congress to make sure we can continue to send Ukraine the weapons they need to defend themselves and their country without interruption so Ukraine can stop Putin's brutality in Ukraine. They are succeeding. When Putin invaded Ukraine, he thought he would take Kyiv and all of Ukraine in a matter of days. Well, over a year later, Putin has failed, and he continues to fail. Kyiv still stands because of the bravery of the Ukrainian people. Ukraine has regained more than 50 percent of the territory Russian troops once occupied, backed by U.S.-led coalition of more than 50 countries around the world, all doing its part to support Kyiv. What would happen if we walked away? We are the essential nation. Meanwhile, Putin has turned to Iran and North Korea to buy attack drones and ammunition to terrorize Ukrainian cities and people. From the outset, I've said, I will not send American troops to fight in Ukraine. All Ukraine is asking for is help for the weapons, munitions, the capacity, the capability to push invading Russian forces off their land and the air defense system to shoot down Russian missiles before they destroy Ukrainian cities. Let me be clear about something. We send Ukrainian equipment sitting in our stockpiles. And when we use the money allocated by Congress, we use it to replenish our own stores, our own stockpiles, with new equipment, equipment that, def that defends America 
and is made in America. Patriot missiles for air defense batteries, made in Arizona. Artillery shells manufactured in 12 states across the country, in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Texas, and so much more. You know, just as in World War II, today patriotic American workers are building the arsenal of democracy and serving the cause of freedom. Let me close with this. Earlier this year, I boarded Air Force One for a secret flight to Poland. There, I boarded a train with blacked-out windows for a 10-hour ride each way to Kyiv to stand with the people of Ukraine ahead of the one-year anniversary of their brave fight against Putin. And I'm told I was the first American to enter a war zone not controlled by the United States military since President Lincoln. With me was just a small group of security personnel and a few advisors. But when I exited that train and met Zelensky, President Zelensky, I didn't feel alone. I was bringing with me the idea of America, the promise of America, to the people who are today fighting for the same things we fought for 250 years ago, freedom, independence, self-determination. As I walked through Kyiv with President Zelensky, with air raid sirens sounding in the distance, I felt something I've always believed more strongly than ever before. America is a beacon to the world, still, still.